Good morning, church. Good morning. Good to be with you, worship with you this morning. Uh, before we get started in our service, uh, just a couple of things. Um, the Congregational Life uh, will meet on Tuesday, uh, that group of people. Um, and then Saturday is pretty important. It is our work day, uh, spring uh, cleanup day here at the church. It uh, starts at 9 o'clock. If you could be a part of that, help us out, that would be awesome. Uh, always can use uh, people to do the different things it takes to get our place ready for the summer. Uh, changing windows, storm windows out, and getting um, miscellaneous things around the yard uh, ready to go, and those sorts of things. So those two things are coming up this week, and uh, we are um, hopeful that uh, we get a, uh, a good, good group to turn out to help us with that. Any other announcements that need to be made this morning before we begin our worship? <coughs> If not, let's begin by just having, pausing for just a moment, creating space, time and space for the living God. Amen. Join me in our call to worship. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Blessing and honor and glory and glory be to the one seated on the throne of the Lamb and The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who was and is and come. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? You alone are holy. All the earth will come and worship before you. For your righteous deeds have been revealed to all the seek. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
morning, family. Today we join with the generous, faithful believers in offering ourselves to God through the words of the Psalms. Today's reading is Psalm number 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of the Israel, and you our fathers trusted, they trusted and even delivered them. From you comes my praise in the great congregation, my vows I will perform before those who fear him. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. The scriptures inform us that full payment for our sins was offered in the death of Jesus. When Jesus was raised from the dead, God gave evidence to all sins, power over us broken to eternal life, conquered death. Let us confess our sin in the light of the cross and the res resurrection of Jesus, our risen King. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned and wandering from your ways, and wasting your gifts and forgetting your love. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The profit and pleasures we pursue, pursue demanded on our earth. The fears and jealousies that we labor set neighbors against neighbors, nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom of intellect and reason and turn them into bonds of oppression. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for you knowing us well. You know that we are weak and prone to wander. Set us free from the past that we cannot change. Open to us the future which we can change, and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Take a moment of silent prayer of reflection. Amen. God has raised Jesus from the dead as the first fruits of the kingdom. New life has begun in Christ Jesus. New life has been given to us. Forgive us sins in certain to all who believe. Let's take a moment to share God's love with one another.
Would you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you once again for the privilege we have of opening a book and reading words. Not just any words, but words that have been God-breathed, God-sent. Sent to give us hope. Sent to edify us. Sent to reprove us. Sent to encourage us. Words sent to build us up in the faith. So give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand that which you have for us this day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our text today comes to us as we continue to work through the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in verse 7. Beloved, let us not love one another, or let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that God has loved us and send his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, then we ought to love one another. No one's ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So, whoever confesses Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and they abide in God. So we come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in them. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as God is, so are we also in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. And if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he cannot, or his brother, uh, who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, excuse me, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must love also their brother. This is the word of the Lord. Well, once again, I, I'm in this book, this book of 1 John. Um, it has become a, a point of conversation with my minister friends as I've sought to work my way through this book and figure out how to take what it says and relay it to you, because it's not easy. It is one of the, I, I gotta be honest with you, people think that like the book of Leviticus is difficult. That's a piece of cake. You know, something in the Old Testament that's obscure. Wow, that would really be tough. No, First John is really a very, very complicated, very difficult book. Today's message and today's scripture works its way off of what we talked about last week. Two times in the text, it tells us that God is love. I want you to think about that just for a second. God is love. We're going to come back to that. It also tells us that God's love is known through some sort of action. That love is not something we can separate or is apart from something that God is doing or God does. It is part of an action. And that action is sending Jesus to be our propitiation, the propitiation for our sins. And then it goes on to tell us, just like we talked last week, if God loves us in such a way, then there is a correlation to that. And the correlation is you and I 
are then to love one another. So if God did this, then the word that is used there in the New Testament, we ought. So it's not a suggestion, it is more an expectation. We ought to do towards others exactly what God has done toward us. And then it tells us today that God love the love that God defines for us in this action of Christ we are able to do that because God has first loved us so in other words you and I are able to have this expression towards others because first of all we have had it experienced in our own life from God and as a result of that experience of what God's love is to us, we are then able to love others. And apart from that, we really can't in a biblical sense. And then it says that the true Christian faith is a combination of both believing in Jesus, who is the Messiah, and loving one another. Let's begin. Let's, let's just kind of look at various aspects of it and just kind of take it apart and just play with it a little bit. I am convinced that as human beings, we are free to define love however we want to do that. I don't think, I don't think that there's a way in this world that you're, we're going to be able to get anyone to change their mind on what they think love is. I'm convinced of that. Love is the most used word in the most bizarre way of any word in our culture. We can define it any way we want. We can make it sentimental. We can actually believe that the dog who is our pet loves us. We can look at those eyes and we can look at the way it responds and says, oh, he loves me. We can believe that. I'm not going to talk anybody who believes that out of that. It's impossible. We can make it romantic. We can say, I love that woman. I can tell Julie I love her and she tells me all the time that she loves me. I don't know if that's a romantic sense or not, if it's just an obligation or if it's just a duty or if it's just something we do. I'm not really sure at this point. I just know we say it all the time. She says it first and there's an expectation that I say it back. That's love. We just kind of, it can be touchy-feely. You can define it that way. I just feel like I love them. I never feel good. We can use it to describe our feelings towards food. I love whatever. We can use it to define our feelings towards pets. We can use it to define our feelings towards sports teams. I have a very close minister friend who is a devout Cleveland Browns fan who was ready to fall on his knife after the first uh, few picks in the draft this week because his love is such. But then he defined how much his love is. He said he's done. He's burning his Browns jerseys. He's done. He's finished. <laughs> love is kind of fickle that way in our world. You can love a hobby. I love golf. You can love your spouse, you can love your kids, you can love friends, you can love chocolate, you can love the weather, you can love sunshine, you can love summer, I love spring, I love fall more than anything. Love defines all of those things. We use it in such a broad context. It's just kind of the catch-all word that we don't really stop and think, is there a difference between the love I have for Julie and the love I have for chocolate? Would they be different? Is there a difference between the love I have for summer and the love that I have for God? So love, you can define it any way you want. I'm convinced that you can define it any way you want. And you can live with that, and no one can tell you that you are not free to love however you think you want, you, you know, love is. But I will tell you this. As human beings, we are not allowed to define love biblically in any terms other than the way God does. 
So when God is talking about love, it is a totally different thing, a totally different animal. I wish we had a different word for it. Because again, that word is so used in so many ways, so broadly, in so many contexts, it really has no meaning to us. There is one way to define biblical love. God defines it because God is love and God has shown us what that love looks like. We can only define it in strictest terms because God has established it for us. Now understand this, that the word love that we're talking about is, is in the Greek, there are multiple words for it. It is this word agape or agapeo or however, you know, it's used, whether noun or verb or whatever. It was a unique word. It wasn't used in other Greek writings. In other words, it's almost as if the Christian community took a word and almost like invented it to define what this is. And, and it'd be cool if we could kind of do that again today. Just distinguish it from whatever, whatever else we think love is. And, you know, the interesting thing is that the love associated with God or the worship of God or the gods in that culture was the word eros, erotic type of love. That's why the, the, the pagan temples uh, had all kinds of prostitution and, and all kinds of stuff going on with that. That was the love associated to the gods. And the Christians said, if we're going we're gonna to talk about love for God, then it's got to be a different word. And so they, they almost like invented this word agape or agapeo. If I, were to, if I were to say to you this morning, what are your thoughts on the pericope? You would say, pericope, is that a word? I, I don't, I, I mean, I speak English, but I don't know that I've heard that word spoken in our culture. So you're freed to make up whatever you think pericope is. Let's go pericope. Have you pericope today? You can do whatever you want with the word, but in the Christian community, particularly in the Bible study community, pericope is a section of scripture that has got a definitive beginning and an end to it that contains within it a thought. That's how it's used. So that word is kind of a word that's dedicated only to the faith, the same way that the word agape or God's love is dedicated to the faith. It exists outside of the boundaries used outside of the world as it was at that time and in the world as it is today. Love is fully known and correctly understood by the example of Christ. When we talk about God's love, we're not talking about saying that he loves us. We're not, we're not talking or it's not a reference to assuming that God loves us. When we talk about this kind of love, it is not a feeling that God loves us. This is a definitive act. God so loved that he gave his son. Jesus so loved us that he laid down his life for us. It has a specific, identifiable act that demonstrates and proves what this love is all about. God gave, Christ died. It, that act is done without any reference to worth or any reference to uh, value or how it might be reciprocated. In other words, when God determines to love, it is in the act of Christ giving himself for us. And that is not based upon the fact that he looks down here at Tom and he says, my goodness, that is spectacular. He is amazing. How could I not love him? No. You may think he does that about you, but I got news. No. It has nothing to do with how special we are. Love has to do with an act. It has to do with something that moves God. Because God is love, there is an expression of that love. It must be authenticated. It must be given. And the giving of it is the laying down of the life of Christ 
irrespective of whether we deserve it, irrespective of what we'll do with it. Twice our text tells us that God is love. God is love. What do you think of when you think of that? God is this big sentimental feeling machine. God is this romantic being. God is what? God is the being who gave. God is the being who offered his life for us. God is love. God is also holy. God is light. God is spirit. It speaks to the essence of who God is. That is who God is. That's what God is. He is love. And what he has done for us, and that would almost seem like that his essence of who he is requires that he did it. I would almost argue that God in one sense had no choice but to give us Christ because God is love. Love has to act. It has to give. It has to be something that is extended. God didn't love us and thought good things about us. God didn't love us and say, oh my goodness, I'm just swelling up with something inside. God loved us by giving. Jesus loved us by laying down his life. And John then takes that idea and he says, if God did that for us, who is love, then we ought to do the same thing for one another. In fact, John doubles down on that thought. What John has to tell us is not easy this morning. First of all, John tells us that we, as Christians, love because God first loved us. There's this essence in which having experienced what God has done for us, having seen it, and knowing that God lives with inside of us the very essence of love, then we are able to love as a result of that. We cannot love in a biblical sense apart from first being loved by God. God loves us first. As a result of that, then, there is an expectation that we love one another. God dwells in us by the Spirit. God's love is within us. It's part of who we are. And if it's part of who we are the same way as it is who God is, then it must have some form of outlet. Love is not something that is achieved. Biblical love is not something that is achieved by human effort. But rather it's a deposit that's given to us that we must act upon. John goes further, and every time he goes further, it gets more difficult. Anyone who does not love, biblically defined, doesn't know God. That is hard. God, John is saying that if we are not people who are giving of ourselves to other people in action, then we are people who do not know God. Loving in deed and in truth, as we learned last week. Not in sympathy, not in indifference, just staying away, not, you know, loving, loving is not resisting the urge to let someone have it. Biblical love is the action of extending loving acts to other people, laying down your life for them. Failure to love, according to John, is not failure. It is evidence or it is confirmation that we are still in our sin and we don't know God. I thought about that a lot this week. I don't know what to do with that. I wish I could soften that for you. I wish I could say to you, don't, don't worry about that. But John is telling us that if we fail to act in the way that God has acted toward us, it is not failure, it is evidence that we don't know God. And that's frightening to me. That says to me that I've got some work to do. 
I'm one of these private people. I like my private time. I like to give of myself, but I like to do it on my own terms when it's convenient. And I get tired of giving of myself really quickly. And then I just want me time. I probably am alone in that. John doubles down again. If we do not love our brothers and sisters in the faith, as love is defined, who we see, then it is impossible to love God who we don't see. We can say we love God all we want. Who's going who's to judge that? John is. John's going to say, you can't love God apart from loving those who you see. I find it much easier to think that I love God than it is to love people I actually see. I actually love everybody until I get to know them. I really love people until I have to be with them or listen to them. See, I can be with God and I don't really hear God doing anything or see God doing anything or hear God saying anything. And so it's pretty easy just to say, ah, I love that. John is saying to us, can't do that. The love that we get from God is reciprocated not back to God, it is reciprocated to others. And then John doubles down again. There is no fear in love because perfect love casts out fear. Biblical love is the remedy for a fear of judgment at the end. John, I used to think that that was, I was, in fact, I was informed and taught early on that it was the remedy for all kinds of fear. If I was afraid of something, I just had to, to you know, just know that God loved me. But that's not what he's saying. It's saying that as we actively love others with the love of God, the fear of what might happen on Judgment Day is alleviated. Because we have find our lives in God, we find our lives in Christ. Not only through faith, but also in service. And it gives us peace. It moves us out of the fear that my life has somehow fallen short of what God has intended. It gives me confidence before God. And finally, John tells us this. He takes his foot off the gas a little bit and he backs it off. And he leaves us with something to think about. No one's ever seen God, he said. That's been said in John before, in the Gospel of John. No one's ever seen God. In the Gospel of John, he says, no one's ever seen God but Jesus has displayed him. The person of Jesus shows us who God is. So I can understand a little bit who, about who God is better because I can see Jesus. I like that. That's what he tells us in the gospel. But in this letter, he said there's a second way that people see God. No one's ever seen God, but when the church lives out its commitment to love one another, then the world sees God. That's an amazing thought, that the God is manifested through the person of Christ and through the love of the church. We need to roll up our sleeves and get busy. Perhaps God is not taken seriously in our culture because as the church, church as a whole, we've not really figured out what's important and what it is that God is calling us to do. John tells us that love for one another is the essence of what God has called us to do. That is a different kind of love. It is a great challenge. I pray that we embrace it. Would you bow your heads and let's pray. 
Almighty and loving God, we thank you for the gift of your word. We pray now for the grace to believe what we've heard, to live in ways that honor you above all, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. join me in our profession of faith. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, one in being with the Father. Through him all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. Amen. You may be seated. At this time we'll receive our offering.
you join me in our prayer? God of wonder, we offer you these humble gifts, signs of your goodness and mercy. Receive them with our gratitude. And use them to further the purpose of your kingdom, both in our community and throughout the world. Amen. You may be seated. In our prayer time this morning, we have a special request to pray for Helen Bell. And if you will remember that, also, uh, Barb Zarin has uh, been moved to the nursing home in Grand Rapids. She is open to receiving visits, and so I've been asked to pass that along to you. Uh, that would be a wonderful thing if you could make it out there to see her, okay? As we, op as we offer our prayers before God, we will provide a space, and in that space you are encouraged to lift up those who you have concern for and would like to place before God's throne. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us so much, that you didn't leave us where we were, that you didn't leave us in our sin, you didn't leave us in our brokenness, you didn't leave us in the mess that we make of life, but you came to us in your Son. You freely gave of your Son. Jesus, you freely gave of your life to us. And in doing so, you have brought salvation to us. We thank you. Now we lift up those who have needs. We pray for our world, a world that is torn in so many ways, a world that is ever increasingly fragmented, a world ever increasingly at odds with one another. We pray. We ask, Lord, that you be with those who are in positions of authority. They may use it wisely. They may see themselves as stewards of God. They may rule justly. They may rule humbly. They may rule with the interests of even the weak and the lowly and those who have no voices. These things we pray. We also lift before you our communities in which we are planted. We lift before you people that live around us in our neighborhoods. We lift before you, Father, those who are hurting and struggling, those who are lonely. We lift before you those who are shut in in our congregation. We lift before you those who are facing tough decisions, hard decisions. Especially, Lord, we offer our prayers on behalf of those who you have placed upon our hearts. We bring them before your throne now. We are especially mindful this day of Helen Bell. Lord, as we lift these before your throne, we ask that you would touch their lives. You would be with them. You'd bring healing into their lives. That you would give peace where there is worry and fear. That you, Father, would visit through your presence of your spirit those who are lonely. Father, we lift these before you. We lift our hearts before you. We thank you that you are God, that you have made a way for us to worship you and to love one another. These things we pray in the matchless name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen.
understanding this special day that we have uh, celebrate Frank um, and his uh, birthday. Provided over on the side here is some cake. Family has asked that you would stay and celebrate all of that with Frank. Uh, amazing uh, part of our family here, and each of you are very special to him and to them. And with that, let me offer the blessing. May the Lord our God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you, grant you his peace. May you see the love of God. May you experience the love of God. And may you go forth with that love to others. Go in peace, for we are. Amen. Thank you.